It was early morning in Italy, in the heart of the young and rising city called Rome. The Roman people's third king, Tullus Hostilius, stood before the senate of the city's leading patriarchs, waiting for their quiet talk and whispering to end. Eventually they had ceased, waiting expectantly for the king to declare his intentions to the surrounding senate. Tullus cleared his throat and clasped his hands together and began to speak to the council. Conscript fathers of the senate, good day. I am glad you have answered my summons. Today I wish to speak about the recent actions taken by our neighbors to the southeast, the Albans. A few of the senators muttered to one another, concerned as to what was coming next. King Tullus's people and their neighbors in Alba Longa had lived side by side for about a hundred years since the time when Rome had been founded by the first king Romulus in the year 753 BC. Alba Longa, according to legend, had been built centuries before by Ascanius, the son and heir of the hero Aeneas, who had fled with his father from the fall of Troy and came of age in the region of Latium, where the city of Rome would one day rise. Alba Longa had been Latium's leading city, and had been home to the twins Romulus and Remus before they realized their dream to found a new kingdom. But now the neighboring cities found themselves at odds, each side accusing the other of pillaging the land across their borders. And the outcome was to be fateful for both the Romans and Albans alike. For many seasons, Tullus Hostilius continued, the people of Alba Longa have come and looted from our people as they pleased, while you, senators, have sat here and have not even discussed retaliating or protecting us from their raids. Tullus paused. The senate started grumbling in the rows, but quieted when the king continued. Gaius Cluilius and his people must pay for intruding themselves onto Roman land and taking that which belongs to us. Does the Senate wish to be known as a group of callous and aloof old men who do not have the people's best interest and well-being at heart? The room erupted in a clamor of voices. Some claimed to see through a blatant and vain attempt by Tullus to win glory like that of his grandfather, Hostus Hostilius, who had given his life in battle alongside Romulus. The king's taste for war was no secret. But most of the Senate seemed to be more incensed at the actions of the Albans, and with a challenge thrown at their feet, they joined him in demanding retribution from the Alban king and an end to the raids. Tullus the king smiled wryly. He held his hands out, signaling for the Senate to cease their bickering and speaking. Once the room quieted down, the king went on. Senators, I propose we send envoys to the Alban king and demand he cease these raids. However, in the meantime, we shall muster for war within the month and force them with the sword to put an end to their pillaging of Rome, should they refuse our demands. The Senate roared their approval. All the while, Tullus could feel his chance at glory growing closer by the hour. Some time had passed after the Senate made their decision when King Tullus received guests from Alba. An envoy was sent by their king, Gaius Cluilius, to have an audience with Rome's leader. Tullus agreed to let them in and treated them to a feast over which they would speak of their sudden visit. Tullus spoke first, after they had begun to eat. So, dear neighbors, what has brought the ambassadors of Gaius Cluilius to my humble city? The envoy spoke in between bites. Must we discuss such reasons before I have had a chance to relax after my journey? 
we should not let such a wondrous meal go cold with our prattle, he said, stuffing his face with a hunk of cheese. The men sat around the table, making small talk, and continued to eat, until eventually they called an end to the meal. Now Tullus spoke again. Please, gentlemen, now that we have finished our meal and you have rested from travel, would you kindly share with me your reasons for being here? The envoy replied, We have been sent by our most gracious king on sensitive business, which we hope does not cause offense, O king. Long have we heard reports about Romans raiding our land and taking things that do not belong to your people. We would like you to intercede on our king's behalf and resolve this problem among your own people, unless you'd rather he take things into his own hands. The envoy nervously picked up his cup of wine to drink. Tullus barked out a laugh and exclaimed, That is funny. He should raise the issue of raids and theft, as I too will take these matters into hand. But it is his people and yours that I shall accuse. At the mention of this, the envoy sputtered as he choked on his wine. Tullus let the man regain his composure and spoke again. Now, you will go back to Gaius Cluilius and tell him that the Roman king has called upon the gods to witness. Whichever nation is to ignore the rights and peace of its neighbor shall have visited upon them the sufferings of war. Am I understood? The envoy, wiping the wine spilled down his face, nodded towards him, standing up. Without bidding goodbye, he left the room, his entourage following him out. Tullus was smiling inwardly, the thought of glory and victory burning away any potential doubts he had in his mind. In the days after the envoy had left, the two nations, Rome and Alba, made ready for war. This war was waged reluctantly between the peoples, as they saw one another like family, both of Trojan descent through the lineage of the founder Aeneas and the Alban kings of old. It felt less like a resistance to foreign aggression than a civil war. The Alban forces struck first, pushing into Roman territory just five miles from the city, and surrounding Rome with a vast moat, which would be called the Cluilian Trench, after the name of Alba's king. But before long, news reached Rome that Gaius Cluilius had died in his camp. For the eager Tullus Hostilius, this was a sure sign that the gods were on the side of Rome. The same day he had received the news, Tullus snuck around the enemy encampment with his army, forcing the newly appointed dictator of Alba, Metius Fufetius, to meet them in the field. Battle lines were drawn up as the Roman and Alban hosts stared each other down across the battlefield spears and helmets gleaming in the morning sun. It was quiet, deathly so, as they waited for the command to charge. Then, breaking the silence from the Alban ranks, Metius Fufetius called out toward the Romans. King Tullus, I know you are there. We ask to speak with you on the matter of this war. The Alban leader walked out in front of his lines, arms spread apart in a gesture of peace. Tullus saw him approach and agreed. Both parties strode to the center of the field, their most trusted officers flanking them in case of any attempt to breach the temporary truce. When they finally came together, Metius bowed to the Roman king and began to speak first. King Tullus, I have come to you to discuss the meaning of this war and how my king Gaius Cluilius had started it all over your people's robbing of our lands and your refusal to return what was stolen. Tullus stared coolly at the man, gesturing for him to continue. 
And it seems to me, Metius went on, that you see the same issue from the opposite side, our theft and our raids. However, I think we can both clearly see that the true cause of this war is ambition and greed, since why would our people ever take up arms against one another when we are practically kin? He paused again, glancing at Tullus. The Etruscans are to the north of us, and are waiting for the right moment to strike both of our nations, to subjugate and enslave us all. I propose an idea that will keep both of us strong, and settle this war without shedding needless blood. Tullus stood, scratching his chin in deep contemplation. Several moments passed, Metius waiting intently to learn if Rome's decision would doom them all to carnage. At last, Tullus broke the silence, soothing Metius's fears. What then is your proposal, Lord of Alba? he asked. Metius laid out his plan. I propose we have a group of men fight, three from your side and three from ours. The survivors of the duel shall decide which nation is the master of the other. Tullus again thought for a moment. If he were to accept this, he would still get the battle he was expecting, and he was sure of the victory the gods would grant him this day. He turned toward the Alban and sternly nodded his approval. Who should be the brave warriors we send out to decide our nation's fates? Tullus asked. Metius answered quickly. We in our army have three brothers, triplets by birth, that we will send forward. At this, Tullus grinned. We too have a group of triplets in our army, he responded. We shall send them forward to meet yours, Metius Fufetius. I look forward to this bout. Tullus reached out his hand, which Metius took vigorously. A holy fetial priest named Marcus Valerius, was summoned, as were his servants and a sacrificial swine, to oversee and bind the agreement between nations, with the great god Jupiter as witness. The fetial priest prepared his customary role to seal the treaty, and recognized his Alban counterpart, Spurius Fusius, who was appointed as their ceremonial pater patratus to ratify the agreement on their side. And so the ritual began. The priest intoned for all present to hear, Do you, King Tullus, grant me the power to make a treaty with the Pater Patratus of the Albans? Tullus voiced his agreement, and the Fetiol continued, I demand of thee, O king, the most sacred herbs. The Roman king replied, You may take it, Fetiol, unimpeded. The Fetiol reached forth and grasped the herbs a servant nearby was carrying, then asked the king, Do you, Tullus Hostilius, name me speaker of the Quirites, the Roman people, sanctioning myself and my vessels? And the king answered, So far as it may be without harm towards myself and the Roman people, the Quirites, I do. With the king's blessing, the Fetiol turned toward the Alban Pater Patratus and touched the herbs to his head, and began to recite aloud the holy verses that would bind the agreement. When he finished, he cried to the heavens upon Jupiter himself, Hear me, O Jupiter, hear me, people of Alba and Rome. The conditions of this agreement have been recited and ratified before Jupiter. If the Romans were to scheme or connive their way into breaking or bending this bond, they shall feel his full might and wrath. May he smite the Roman people, as I shall smite this swine. And he struck the pig with his dagger, sacrificing it in Jupiter's name. With this, the ritual was complete. Both sides, now satisfied with the treaty between them, 
returned to their lines to bring forth their champions. The two sets of triplets emerged from their armies and marched toward the center of the field to the sounds of cheers and jeers from the troops, who circled to watch the match like spectators at the games. Fighting for Rome were the brothers Horatius. For Alba came forth the brothers Curiatius. Evenly matched, motivated by loyal duty to family and city, the Horatii and the Curiatii met in the center of the makeshift arena, their arms and armor aglow. A horn blew, and the fateful combat began. With a mighty roar, the brothers clashed, swords swinging against shield and glancing off with a clatter. One of the Roman brothers caught an Alban sword against his shield, only to take another blow that ran through his stomach, his blood pouring over the Alban blade. The first of the Horatii collapsed to the ground, unmoving, and his opponents turned toward the remaining two Romans. Publius Horatius stepped closer to his brother's left, fending off any would-be attacker. One of the Curiatii swung too early, and Publius struck out at him, slashing his leg from thigh to shin, as rivulets of blood rushed their way to the ground. But Publius's brother fared worse, his shield battered by two assailants. He tried to swing at what he thought was an opening in one of their guards, but failed to see it was a trick, and had his sword hand swiftly severed from the arm. Rendered helpless, he was cut down with ease by the onslaught of the Albans. The last of the Roman three, Publius Horatius, was alone now, facing down all three of the Curiatii, who were alive, though wounded. His mind began to race, sweat pouring as he saw his brothers dead at his feet. He pivoted and sprinted across the field, making the Albans give chase. After running a fair distance, he stopped and turned towards them, his lungs heaving. One of the Albans was quickly behind him, the other two a good distance away, the one with the gash down his leg the furthest behind. Publius engaged the first of his foes, swinging his sword with all his fury. The Alban's sword wasn't fast enough, nor his shield placed well, as Publius's sword struck home and pierced him between the ribs. Publius rapidly withdrew his blade, letting his enemy fall to the ground, lifeless. He advanced towards the second of the Curiatii, and with a nimble stroke across his stomach, dispatched him, as blood spilled and he crumbled to the earth. Only one Alban remained, one Horatius and one Curiatius. But the deep wound in the Alban's leg proved severe, no strength left to fend off a foe exhilarated by two victories. The last Curiatius brother went limp and fell to the ground. Publius approached and cried aloud as the two armies looked on, all mouths agape and eyes wide. Two foes have I sacrificed to appease my brother's shades. The third I will offer for the cause of this war that the Romans may rule Alba's lands. With that, Publius plunged his blade into the defenseless Alban's neck, growling with his whole chest. A mighty roar arose from the Roman army as shields, spears, and swords battered together. The Albans, dumbstruck at the sudden fall of their champions, were quiet. The duel was over. The war was ended. Publius Horatius left the field, and King Tullus Hostilius, standing among his retinue, grinned with pleasure at the glorious conquest of Alba that he had won with so little blood. Satisfied with the results of the battle, the two armies turned home, now united as one, under the command of Rome with sword and spear never to be raised against each other again.
the combat of the Horatii and Curiatii would pass into myth, a favorite story of the generations of Romans who came after. But the peace between Alba Longa and Rome would prove to be short-lived, when an act of betrayal by Metius Fufetius would enrage Tullus Hostilius to the point of Alba's utter destruction. Commanding the Romans to dismantle the ancient city of Alba stone by stone, Tullus left only the temples intact as a gesture of piety toward the gods, and all the city's people were made to begin a new life in Rome. With its ancestral home and its rival in Latium wiped from the land, and Alba's people swelling its population, Rome would continue to rise and expand in its long road to power over Latium, then over all of Italy, and finally over an empire. <laughs>